Welcome everyone to the final presentations of the 705 class, Digital Research Methods. Today, we're going to be starting with two-minute PICO presentations, two-minute madness, where each student will give you a taste, a hint, of what they have been doing over the semester. Digital Research Methods is a class that takes students just out of their undergraduate career and says, go figure something out. Go on. As researchers, we're used to the whole, okay, now what? We're used to figuring out the patterns and the tools and the techniques and the research methods and the birds, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> of how to accomplish a task, how to know that we're done, and how to publish our results. <laughs> this class teaches master students that method, where we take students and we say, set yourselves a problem. We start with the scoping. Figure out the narrative that you're going to tell yourself, the narrative of success, and the narrative of completion. From scoping, we move on to elaboration. It's a step not taught in academia, instead borrowed from software development, where we go, okay, you now know what you want to do. Let's figure out which tools will work best for doing that. In academia, we figure out what we want to do and then we go do it, using the habits and the patterns and the knowledge that we have before without going, hold on, is this the right way to do it? Will this tool work throughout the process? Or will I spend four weeks getting my data only to discover that it's a horrible, unnormalized mess that I have to throw out and get some student to renormalize again? Elaboration allows us to pick up, not on every single possible problems, but on general tool suitability. We then move on to an implementation step where we sit down and we think about, okay, here's the tools that you've decided to use, here are the patterns, here's the narrative that you're trying to fill. Let's go through and keep a technical log of every step. What do I expect? What did I do? And then what happened? And by training people's intuitions on what they expect their tool to do, then doing it, a much more self-reflective tool use is enabled where my students can now go to the internet and actually ask questions of Stack Exchange and whatnot and get help because they know what went wrong. And, but we don't stop there. Digital research methods and the digital humanities is worthless without presentations. And so the point of this class and the final structure of this class culminates in today, where we have two minute PICO presentations, allowing an audience from across this faculty to become interested in the GIS, the typesetting, the language processing, all of the fascinating coding problems that we face throughout the semester, giving them hints. And then we have much longer slide presentations, much like a poster session, so that people can self-select and go ask questions of those presentations that they're interested in. And so therefore, this semester is like a very tiny master's project with a very heavy safety net. So I invite you all here and online to watch these PICO presentations. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Phillips, and I am an MRes student studying in the International Studies Department. My research area looks at the influence of Korean popular music, referred to as K-pop, on Japanese music tastes. Japan has been at the forefront of the global boom of K-pop's popularity, and holds a large amount of information that has been, so far, overlooked. I wish to tap into that gold mine of hidden information on the views of the general public, and to do so, I plan to use online forums to conduct large-scale surveys about music preference and taste. But how do I analyze this data and the sub-demographics within it? To do so, I used the digital analysis program R to create a database system, which I tested out during my digital humanities classes by surveying my classmates. R takes survey in responses and can order it into a structured system ready to examine. 
This system then allowed me to ask questions about specific demographics within my survey group and create graphs which I can analyse and insert into word processing and typesetting documents. R is a highly effective tool for my work, cutting down on the time that I would have needed to use to analyse my data and removing the risk of failure of my analysis by way of missing data, a common problem when using Excel. This means that I will now have more time to conduct my real research or my graphs of K-pop data will be more accurate, clearer and more effective than they would have been without using this tool. R has the potential to, to help many researchers improve and streamline their data analysis. In 18 steps, I was able to take my data and create a readable and effective graph. With such little time necessary for completing work in R, I highly recommend anyone else creating databases in the course of their research to, um, to use my work. And I also invite you to use my code and resources to help you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Erin Mansell and I'm a first year MRes student from the Department of Educational Studies. My research is on the topic of parental school choice and preferred learning environments. This is an area of increasing importance as parents are continually faced with the challenge of finding the best school environment for their child to ensure that their child's social, emotional and educational needs are being met. This semester I have examined the school choice process in my own school's small scale research project where I conducted six semi-structured interviews with parents from independent Catholic and public schools. Have you ever wondered how do I extract meaning from interviews? I asked myself this question as I began to conduct my interviews with parents. I became concerned that I would not have enough time to translate the interviews into text. I realised that I needed a better system than manually highlighting themes and sifting through mountains of paperwork that I might not be able to find at the end of the project. Consequently, I began to look for a digital solution. My e-research project addresses the problem of finding a cost-effective way of storing and sorting my parent interview data into themes through the use of open source software, and this has improved the consistency of my analysis. Another success of this project is that I have used Google services for translating my interview transcripts. This process has resulted in me spending two hours of editing per interview instead of the six to eight hours um, that I would have otherwise spent if I had to transcribe by hand. The digital skills that I have learned through, my, uh, through this unit will be incredibly value for me, valuable for me throughout my academic career. I have achieved above and beyond what I would have imagined would be possible, particularly because I had no prior experience in computer programming. I will take these newly acquired skills with me into the future with a newfound respect for the use of digital methods in qualitative research. Good morning, my name is Graziano Foyce and I'm with the Department of Anthropology. Last Wednesday we saw hordes of fanatical footy fans gather to watch the first State of Origin game at Suncorp Stadium. In much the same way, people come together online to watch live broadcasts of video games being played competitively. In the stadium, people express their fandom with claps and cheers. Online, fans exchange type messages in a chat room, however, beyond that, Little is known about the relationship between online fandom and competitive gaming. For this project, I have provided a method for exploring the live chat of this virtual community. With reference to figures one and two, I can take the text and sort it into semantic categories, highlighting the emotional scope of the comments. In addition, I can take the individual positive and negative words of the chat and present them side by side to showcase the language used by this community. As a bonus feature, I can both size and colour the words in the images according to frequency and semantic severity, with the most negative and positive words being the largest and deepest shades of red and blue. For this project, I have collected and analysed over 100,000 lines of live chat. Now I can admit that for an outsider looking in, the meaning of certain words is difficult to interpret. However, the point of this project was never about replacing observation with automation. Put simply, I needed a machine to do the heavy lifting so I could, in theory, do most of the thinking. 
The result is a complementary machine researcher relationship that facilitates academic inquiries into online fandom and competitive gaming. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Catherine Elliott and I'm in the Department of Sociology. I'm interested in home cooking and perceptions of healthy eating. Public concern about obesity has fostered intense debate about the causes of widespread population weight gain. One area which has received both academic and media attention is increasing portion sizes. Have our meals changed from this to this? Increased portion sizes have been documented in fast food menus. However, there is little known about the role of published recipes in changing portion size perception. This semester, I have been working on a method of finding and analysing the ingredients used in newspaper recipes. I know from experience that manually collecting, reading and analysing newspaper articles is laborious and tedious. During the qualitative research methods course, it took me a day per article. For my proof of concept, I have downloaded 1,500 articles from the Sydney Morning Herald archives. I then used machine learning to find recipes and ingredient lists in these articles. The machine learning technique I have used teaches your computer to identify and recognise words and semantic structures. With machine learning, instead of a day per article, it takes my old, heavy and unglamorous computer about 10 minutes to read 1,500 articles and identify the recipes. For my proof of concept, I show how <coughs> recipe ingredients can be quickly identified and extracted from two years of newspaper articles. These ingredients can then be compared and analysed to find out if there has been a change in published recipe portions. For a master's project, even more data could be used. Thank you. Hi, I'm Warren from Modern History. In World War I, an Australian soldier serving in Field Artillery Battery Transport Services wrote a diary. Using this diary, a database of primary sources and mapping software called the Geographic Information System or GIS. I am using war maps and plotting locations and transforming them into a useful data set. With this data set I am analysing one man's war experiences through campaigns and contrasting them with official accounts of war history written by commanders, victors and historians. I'm exploring the plurality of war experience, the difference between the plan and the reality, what commanders ordered and what the rank and file did. I'm also exploring that moment in history where horse transport, centuries old, was irreversibly challenged by industrial age war logistics. Our family has often wondered how our grandfather's transport service diary could be used. I've learned with GIS we can transform disparate data sets like handwritten diaries, notes, reports, high command orders and transform them into useful data so that it's reusable and accessible to anyone. GIS also helps traditional narrative historiography move away from the big event accounts of war and focus on the backline stories of individual servicemen in a new way. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jeremy Hall Spence, and I am studying storytelling and board games in the Department of Media, Music, Communication, and Cultural Studies. However, my project for this unit has been far broader than that. As writing is the one certainty in academia, I wanted to find a way to save time when writing, and was able to do so through the use of typesetting software. Modern typesetting involves the use of computer programs to automatically format text to specified requirements. These requirements can be anything, such as the standards of a journal article or the style guide of a university. The problem with this process is that programs such as Microsoft Word and OpenOffice are not designed for typesetting, yet are the most prominently used typesetting tools. As of such, my task this semester has been to learn how to use the dedicated typesetting tool LaTeX, which uses code to format text. In contrast to Word, LaTeX offers a greater degree of control and consistency. It allows users to make precise changes to the formatting of their document without altering the whole text, 
but also allows users to change their entire document's format with only a few lines of code. For example, LaTeX can change a Word document like this into a journal article, a book, or even a presentation with only a few minutes of alterations. Comparatively for Word, this process requires the manual reformatting of the entire document, which could take hours. LaTeX also saves time on referencing by being able to automatically format citations. Therefore, the use of dedicated typesetting programs such as LaTeX saves users time when formatting text and results in better, more professional looking final documents. It is applicable to all fields and styles of writing, from journal submissions to technical documents, and can greatly benefit any workflow process. Thank you.